So let's kick off with four of the fundamentals of positioning. Number one is the power of market context. When people come across a new product, they look for contextual clues to help them figure out what it is and whether they should care about it. And some of these clues can be more subliminal than others. Some common examples of these clues include things like your messaging, pricing, features, branding, partners, and customers. Put yourself in your customer's shoes. If someone came to you offering a product but had no online presence, no customers to show you, no brand identity, just their name and their word, regardless of how amazing that product might actually be, you probably wouldn't see the value, would you? People make snap judgments from clues like this that can quickly pigeonhole you right out of their consideration set if you're not careful. Number two, that people don't care about your features. When people start the positioning process, a lot of the time, they make the mistake of going in with a feature-first mindset and then working their way back to the market problem. This isn't the best way to go about it. To get the best results, you want to start with the market problem and then follow them up with what your product does to solve that problem and the benefits of that resolution. And then finish the cycle by pairing those solutions and benefits up to features. The most fundamentally important thing to remember when working on your positioning is that it's about problems, not features. Your customers do not care about your features, no matter how revolutionary they might be. All they care about is how those features, in turn, make their life easier. Number three is that your positioning work is for internal use. Some companies use that positioning statement we showed earlier, but whether you do or don't, these aren't for external use on your website or any other type of marketing collateral. Your positioning work is for internal use only to A, ensure everyone's on the same page, and B, ensure all your messaging is aligned back to this source of truth. Number four, your positioning work should be tailored. You can't target everyone with the same positioning. Maybe your solution spans across several different market categories. Maybe you have several wildly different personas within a single category. Either way, your positioning is unlikely to be a catch-all. If this is your first round of positioning, we suggest starting with the market category who offers the greatest value in terms of both size, revenue, and adoption of your solution first and then tackling the positioning for your remaining customer clusters. Here's a short video with April Dunford on picking and creating market categories. Um, there's, a, there's an example that I use in, in the book, which is one of the few category creators I know, um, which uh, I did a long interview with the founder and former CEO of Eloqua. And so he talked about how he essentially created the category of marketing automation. Now, in that case, it's really interesting. I mean, he did not set out to be a category creator. Um, he simply saw a role inside the company, which in this case, it was demand gen marketers. So he noticed that inside the marketing department, there were these regular marketers, and then there were these weirdos, like the demand gen people, and they were all numbers, and they had a spreadsheet, and they were doing all this complicated stuff with numbers. And he said, I can automate that. So his idea originally was, this is gonna be demand gen automation, and it's software for these people. And then what happened is that Demand gen took off as a, as a function, as a role within marketing. Um, and as people hired more and more demand gen marketers, there was more and more demand for this system that Eloqua was selling. And eventually, demand gen became such a thing that it became almost synonymous with marketing. So then Mark changed the name. Well, it's not demand gen automation anymore. It's marketing automation. There we go. Category created. Um, there, there's actually few examples of what I would call pure category creation, which, which is when you're, you're essentially starting from nothing, where you say, you know what, um, I have a product, and what it is is a flu flummer. 
and then the next question is, what the heck's a flu flummer? Why do I need that? And, and how is it different from a CRM or an email or anything else you have? And there just aren't a lot of good examples of companies that have actually done that. I participated and led an effort to create a category at one point in my career inside IBM. And I'm not sure how I would have done it at a startup without IBM levels of resources. Like I spent a lot of time and money going out and working with customers. We spent a lot of time with industry analysts, convincing them that the category deserved to exist and they should back us up on that. We spent a lot of time with uh, press and influencers that could help us tell the story around what it was. And yeah. my budget was massive, but there was also a massive opportunity. I mean, in the first, we launched a new set of products and within the first year we were doing 300 million revenue. A little company <laughs> can't do that. But before we launched it, there was a year and a half of essentially setting the scene for this where we made nothing, zero. So. I don't know, it's harder for smaller companies to do.